Thank you, David. Morning, everyone. Uh, if I haven't met you yet, my name is Matt, and uh, I'm glad you're here, uh, especially today, a bit of a day of, of celebration for us as a church. Uh, that's why we have the special logo, uh, five years of, of ministry. Uh, we have an opportunity uh, to remember and reflect on what God's done, and then and look to the future. I should, should tell you, uh, next week we're going to start a new sermon series. So we usually have a fall series. Uh, it's not going to start today. It's going to start next week. Uh, it's going to be in the book of Hosea. So uh, it's a book in the Old, uh, Old Testament, one of the prophets. Uh, a great thing to do this week would be to read through even the first three chapters just to kind of get a feel for it. So that'll take us through the fall and into the new year. But for today, uh, we wanted to set this day aside and take a moment uh, to remember, reflect, to celebrate. So that's, that's really what we're going to do. Two things. We're going to remember what God has done in our short uh, ministry, short uh, history as a church, uh, reflect on it, celebrate that, and then look to the future of what God might have for us uh, in the years to come. Now, uh, here's how I want to begin. I want to begin just for a moment thinking about celebrating itself. Okay, uh, Celebrating, for the most part, comes naturally to us as human beings, I think. If you look at most of the cultures around the world, there's some, some type of celebration woven into the fabric of every culture. I mean, we celebrate all sorts of things, big and small, right? We celebrate... Uh, think of in, in the States, Independence Day, we have Canada Day, we have Bastille Day, we have Cinco de Mayo, we have celebrations for battles that have been won, for independence that has been gained, for treaties signed. On small levels, we celebrate all, all sorts of things, birthdays, anniversaries, graduations, new homes, new jobs. We celebrate when people leave on a vacation, we celebrate when they come back. We, we celebrate all the time, uh, frankly, as human beings, sports is really just one big celebration, if you think about it, unless, of course, you know, you're a Canucks fan, and then it's intermittent celebration throughout the years, but it's still there. But I do think for some of us, uh, s- celebrating doesn't come as naturally. I think some of us resist the, the, the idea of celebration. And it's not just that we're sticks in the mud or scrooges. I think, I think some of us realize that human beings can tend to get carried away with all of this Celebrating. I mean, there's plenty of celebrations, we might say, that have totally lost their meaning. They're just an excuse to have a party, an excuse to have cake in the middle of the day, right? There isn't really any meaning there. For example, I think there's one celebration that fits into this category. I think St. Patrick's Day is maybe a good example of this, okay? <laughs> I don't know if you realize, but there actually is meaning behind St. Patrick's Day. Uh, it was a day that celebrated uh, St. Patrick, who brought the gospel of Jesus to Ireland. He was the first Christian missionary who came to Ireland, preached the gospel faithfully, there was a day set aside to remember that and to reflect. It was like a a feast day. Now it has become a a day to paint yourself green, I think, drink green beer. It just doesn't seem like it quite connects with that same, you know, meaning that was there at the beginning. So some of us, especially in the church, we have this sense of, look, celebrations, it's just, it's a bit much. Sometimes you hear people say, man, couldn't, is this really the best use of our time and energy? Is this really the best use of our resources as a church? Do we really need three bouncy castles outside to celebrate this? Or could we not s- spend the money on something better? Well, to the cynics, I would just point out that in the Bible, you will find a lot of celebrating. I mean, in every nook and cranny, in every book of, not every book, Lamentations, uh, you may be hard-pressed to find some celebrating, but most of the places in the Bible, people are celebrating. People, are, There's reason to celebrate. I want to point out a couple of key Uh, moments in the history of God's people and the celebration that follows. For example, the Exodus story, right? One of the most dramatic and significant events in our history uh, as a people. Uh, God's people were in slavery for hundreds of years. They were crying out uh, for God to free them from the Egyptians. Finally, God sent Moses who came in, said, you know, let my people go on behalf of God. They wouldn't let them go. Then God brought the 10 plagues to humble the Egyptians, Pharaoh in particular, Finally, the people of God were, were said, go, go. They, they left, but then the Red Sea was in front of them. The Egyptians started to follow after them. They were in a bind, and then God miraculously parts the Red Sea. The God's people walk across dry land. Pharaoh's army comes after them. The waters crash in and destroy them. And then right at that moment, as they're like dripping with sea mist and have seaweed in their sandals, they stop. And they sing a song of celebration. Here it is. Here's Exodus 15, verse 1. Then Moses... And the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. 
The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. The song uh, continues for like 15 more verses, telling the whole story of how God rescued his people, uh, extolling the virtue and the power of God. And this song would have been sung for generations so that the generations that followed would be able to remember and celebrate what God did. But they didn't just write a song. They also built a monument. See, years later, uh, once Moses was gone, now Joshua was in charge of God's people, and God once again brought his people safely through a body of water. They were on their way to the promised land. He, he stopped the Jordan River. They walked across dry land again. And when they got to the other side, uh, God told Joshua, okay, get all the, the leaders of the tribes, the 12 tribes, to go get a stone from the middle of the river and then make a big pile of stones, like a monument. And it was for a purpose. Here, here's what it is, Joshua 4.21. And he said to the people of Israel, when your children ask their fathers in times to come, what do these stones mean? Then you shall let your children know Israel passed over this Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea. So there was an opportunity every time they passed by. These, what do these stones mean? It, remember what God did. Let's celebrate the amazing provision of God, how he cares for his people. But God's people also had other celebrations. I mean, the whole uh, Jewish calendar was filled with festivals and feasts. Uh, anchored in the middle was the Passover, which also was uh, remembering a part of the Exodus story. When at the 10th the plague, when Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he wasn't going to let the people go, God brought the angel of death to come over the land to kill the firstborn uh, sons, but he spared his people. He said, take a lamb, an unblemished lamb, kill the lamb, put the blood on the doorpost. I will pass over in grace and mercy. And so the Passover became one of the central features in the life of God's people. They would remember God's provision and his mercy. But there were others, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Hanukkah, Purim. These were feasts and celebrations. They happened all the time. In fact, in the Old Testament, if you were one of God's people, there was uh, there was your tithe that you would give financially, but then you would give an additional uh, 3%, I think it was, and that money would just be stored up for, for parties, for festivals. So it was like a party tax, not tax, tithe. That was, that was the value that was placed on these festivals and celebrations. And so you might say to yourself, well, what uh, happened to those things? Why, why don't we have those kinds of festivals uh, to this day? Uh, are we not still thankful for all that God has done for us in the past? And of course, the answer is yes. Absolutely, we're thankful. But now we celebrate an even greater rescue. Now we celebrate the rescue that has come through Jesus. Because Jesus is the Lamb of God. His death and resurrection provide the ultimate exodus from slavery to sin, the perfect atonement, to appease the judgment of God. His spirit now lives within us, brings us intimacy with God wherever we go. His resurrection is the promise we have of life forever with him in heaven where we will feast with him at his banqueting table. The communion meal is, is the rhythm of, of remembering and celebrating. That as we come together to remember the body and blood of Jesus on the cross, we also are remembering the salvation of God and that we are united with him by faith. See, this, this truth, this gospel truth gives us reason, gives like every Christian all over the world reason to celebrate. And, and that should mark the church, every Christian church. If, if you're a Christian, people should say sometimes about you, man, you're, why are you always celebrating so much? Why are you always so happy all the time? It's not that we don't have sorrow. It's just that there, there are, we have reason to celebrate, and people should notice that about us. But, but we should also recognize that there are specific things that God has done in each particular local church that gives us reason to praise him in particular. And so that's what today is about for us. As I said, our history is, is not long. Five years, it's like the, a blink of an eye, right, in terms of the grand uh, history of what God has been doing. And yet, in that blink, God has done things that have changed people's lives for all of eternity. And, and it's good for us to remember what has happened. It's, it's good for us to remember that there have been people who have come to faith through this ministry by the power of God. There have been people that, have, that are now alive forever in Christ because of what he's done through us. That's the joy we've had some names that come to my mind, Dana, Shadi, Takashi, Camille, Austin, others who, who people invited, people shared about Jesus. They came, heard the gospel preached, were 
part of the community and they said yes to Jesus and now are forever in him. What a joy for us to be part of that. What a great thing that God has done. We've also had baptisms. Uh, we counted, we've had about 49 baptisms since we started, which every time is someone, maybe someone who grew up in the church or someone new to faith, but is, is saying, look, now uh, Jesus, I'm with Jesus. I, I'm, I'm dead with him in his death and now alive with him in his resurrection. I'm in Christ. This is what he's, what he's done. And it's a celebration at the time and great for us to remember that people have taken those steps of faith and obedience. We've had bodies that have been healed uh, in answers to our prayers. We've had marriages that have been helped. We've had hearts that have been softened, friendships restored. We've grown in our faith by the grace of God. Now, um, I don't want you to misunderstand me. Uh, there have also been difficult times over the last five years. There, there have been tears, a lot of hardships. I mean, there have been relationships that are broken apart and have not gotten back together. There have been hospital visits. There have been surgeries. There have been medical diagnoses, financial struggles, unexpected life disappointments. There have been funerals. We've had our first worldwide pandemic in our lifetime. But here's the thing. None of those things have hindered the work of God in our lives. In fact, it's just the opposite. I mean, God has used all of those things to continue to do the good work of sanctification in our lives. And so for those of us who've had eyes to see and ears to hear, these times of difficulty had ma have made the words of James all the more clear in our minds and our heart. These words, James 1, 2 to 4, where he says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. That, that's what Jesus has been doing in our lives, even in the difficult times over the last five years. But I think it's helpful for us to realize that this, this work of Christ is a work that he has been doing actually for a long time, right here in this place like on this property. I think, it's, I think it's helpful for us to understand Tri-City Church in these terms. N not, not that we started something new, something brand new, or all of a sudden th something got started. It's more like we just stepped into the river of God's grace that had already been poured out in this area. That there are already people who've been called here to do the, the good work of gospel ministry. Now we get to be a part of it for this next season. Uh, I'm not sure if you realize it, but this building... This building was built in 1971-72 uh, is when Mary Hill Baptist Church was, was put up this, actually this square here was the first part of it. Uh, the other outside parts weren't there. They, they built it because they wanted to establish a, a place in this area where people could come and hear the gospel, where people would grow in faith, wanted to establish a vibrant church, and then Hyde Creek Community Church, an MB church from our denomination, uh, took it over, had a season of ministry where they were again telling people about Jesus, helping people to grow in Jesus. And then five years ago, we took it over again, put some paint on the walls, and continued on with that same idea. Our history is not very long. But God's history in this place and in our community is, is long-standing. So before we go any further, what I'd like to do is just to remember. Remember what God has been doing over the last few years. Uh, we, we didn't write a song. Uh, we didn't build a monument. What we did is make a super sweet slideshow, okay, that will stand the test of time for generations to come <laughs> on a hard drive somewhere. Um, and, uh, and what I want you to note, at the beginning of the slideshow, actually, uh, a few years ago, someone came by the church uh, from Mary Hill Baptist back in the day, and they gave me a DVD. And they said, there's footage on here of the original church. So we we took a look at it, and we, you're going to see uh, the building being built by some of those back in the 70s that did it, and then we'll transition into the years of ministry here. So if you're new here with us, please indulge us, a bit of home movies for a bit, and uh, then we'll get back uh, to the sermons. Let's take a look.
Great. Thank you to David for combing through our archives. Uh, it's great to see all those memories. Hopefully those of you who are there remember them. Uh, I would like to stop at this point and just pray a prayer of thanksgiving, just in thinking about all that God has done, praising him for what he's done. So let's pause together. Lord Jesus, we are thankful, so thankful for the good work of ministry that you've done in and through us. What a joy it is to, to see and remember the faces that have been a part of this ministry and it's difficult to see the work that you've done in people's hearts, and yet, Lord, we see lives changed, and so we know that it's true. We know your spirit is moving like the wind. We can see it in the trees, and so, uh, Lord Jesus, we just thank you for that. We thank you that we've had uh, the privilege of being a part of it, and Lord Jesus, we don't take for granted that this is anything because of our wisdom, our power. This is, this is you. You're the one who grows your church. You're the one who brings salvation. You're the one who brings sanctification, and so we thank you that we've had the pleasure of of being a part of it and seeing it work in our own lives. And we pray for more of it, Lord Jesus. We pray that this would just be the beginning. And so please, Lord, guide us and help us as we think to the future now. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And that is what we're going to do now, is to think a bit about what is to come. Uh, given all that's come before us, uh, what vision should we have for ourselves as the church? And I'll just say to you, it's, it's not complicated. It's not actually anything new. We've had it on our wall almost since uh, the beginning. Uh, we exist to make Jesus known. Uh, all that we have uh, to celebrate is really because this has happened to some degree. That in some way Jesus has been made known to someone in our own hearts, in our own lives, to, to people who didn't know him yet, because to truly know Jesus is to be united to him by faith. And the fruit of that union is a genuine and lasting life transformation. That, that's the difference. That's why we do this. That's why we exalt him as our Savior and Lord, because with Jesus, 
everything changes. We go from death to life. We go from despair to hope. We go from people who are lost to people who are found. We go from slavery to freedom, from bringing glory to ourselves to bringing glory to God. And it's all because of Jesus. There is, there is nothing and no one more satisfying than him. Uh, the first uh, sermon series that we did was in the book of Philippians. And one of the reasons I chose that book was because I wanted to make sure that we preached these couple of verses early on in our ministry, where Paul says this, Philippians 3, 8, and 9. He says, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. He's saying everything else that I have is worth nothing compared to knowing Jesus. He is the one who brings genuine life, not according to my works, the law, but according to just by faith, the, the, the grace that he's given. So our vision is the same. We need to make Jesus known to as many people as possible. Uh, God is the one who saves, but he's chosen to use us to do that, and that's our privilege and our pleasure. But the question uh, then is how? How can we do this? How will we seek to accomplish this goal most effectively? And, and I would say this to you. Uh, it will happen if we under, understand ourselves to be a people who are both sent and sending. Okay, We are a sent people and a people who are... At, to send others. And here's what I mean by that. We shouldn't just be excited or interested in our church growing. I mean, that, that is a good thing. Uh, it, it generally means if more people are, say, attending on a Sunday morning, that more people are coming to faith or are growing in their faith. We should want that. We should be in prayer for all of the gospel-preaching churches in our area, that all of them grow. That should be our joy. But we should also be excited about new things starting, new ministries, new, new churches, we as a church should be thinking and praying about how we can send out people from our midst so that there'd be other opportunities and other areas for people to come to know Jesus. Now, for some of you, uh, this is obvious, right? This is just part of what it means to be the church, especially uh, if you were part of our, our sending churches, Westside, Crossridge, and Northview. Uh, planting for them is just embedded into their DNA as a church. But that's not always the case for churches. Uh, I've, I've been, you know, around churches where there's strong elements in their ministry, strong parts where people are growing, but they just, they never seem to get around to church planting. There never, never seems to be a, a conversation or something that happens, and there's lots of reasons for that. Sometimes churches are just sort of occupied with the drama that's going on in the inside of the church. Sometimes they're just focused on the, the goals they have for their church, and it's, it's difficult to plant churches. It takes a lot of, lot of time and resources. It requires uh, sacrificing people and, and money and, and things that we have to go out and start something new. But I just need to say there's no way around it, biblically speaking. Exponential multiplication, like church planting, has always been hardwired into the nature of God and the nature of his people, which means it's integral to the faithfulness of any church. Uh, you see this pattern, this sent and sending pattern throughout the Bible. So in the Old Testament... What do we see right at the very beginning? God creates a people, Adam and Eve, and, and then he sends them out. He says, go, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth with my glory. That's his intention from the very beginning. To Abraham, he says, go from your country to the land I will show you. In you, all of the families of the earth will be blessed. There's this promise of exponential multiplication and blessing that comes as, as he goes. You see it in the negative as well. The Tower of Babel was everyone staying together, right? Contrary to God's instructions. They stayed together, built a tower to glorify themselves. God comes and disperses them. He says, no, that's not my plan. Go out into the world. That's what you're supposed to do. Jonah, very reluctant to go, obviously. God's response is severe discipline. Right? You're supposed to go to those who are in need. Go where I'm calling you. Of course, in the New Testament, we see this pattern explicitly. I mean, Jesus, Jesus is sent. He comes down from heaven. And then once he has disciples, he says to them, here's what he says. It couldn't be clear. John 20, 21. He says, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. That's the whole plan. The disciples were there so they would be sent out with the message of the gospel. Tri-City Church was planted out of this ethos. Okay, if you were with us from the very beginning, uh, you may remember that we had um, a fundraising event that was designed to raise money. Here's the slide. It's me doing my late 
night talk show host impression. But look at the title. Tri-City Church Sent and Sending Variety Show Fundraiser. Uh, that was the whole idea. In fact, at Westside, that's always what we called it when we did events to promote. We did campuses or churches. It was always a sent and sending event because we wanted everyone just to be reminded all the time, this is part of our identity as a church, as a people, that we were sent by God, each and every one of us as individuals. Jesus said to his disciples, look, go and make disciples. That's what you're, you're supposed to do. Every one of us who knows Jesus, we've been called, we've been sent, but, but there are also times where we will be sending. Established churches are meant to send others out into the world with, with this message of good news. That's the strategy of God to reach all the lost people in the world. Uh, there's a church in North Carolina. It's called the Summit Church. Uh, the pastor there is, is J.D. Greer. They've, they've embraced this biblical vision with great enthusiasm. So their stated goal uh, is to plant uh, 1,000 churches in 40 years, which sounds like one of those audacious you know, goals. How would you possibly do that? Uh, their plan is to plant five churches a year, which is pretty good. Uh, but if you do the math, even if they do that for 40 years, that's only 200 churches, which is a lot, but not, not 1,000. But that's, that's not their plan. Their plan isn't just for them to plant five churches a year. Their, their plan is for the churches they plant to plant churches. And if their church plants plant one church every five years, they calculate they'll get to 1,000 churches by the year 2046. And, and so we just need to understand exponential growth isn't just good for our retirement fund. Okay, it is. That's why we love it. But that, that is the plan of God. That's how the gospel is intended to spread. That disciples of Jesus are meant to make disciples who make disciples. And churches are meant to plant churches who plant churches. That's... That's the whole plan. That's what God intended for us. So how are we going to do this is the question. Well, thankfully, uh, one thing we've learned from planting this church is that we don't have to do it alone. In fact, it's so much better to do it with friends, right? We were, we were a, a united church plant. Uh, Westside, Northview, Crossridge, all coming together, like-minded. It was a huge blessing for us. Uh, I just got to tell you, if you... If you weren't here at the beginning, there were so many evidences of, of practical support from these churches. Uh, there were times, I mean, our first day camp, the Northview kids team, their whole team came out and ran it for us. We, we, we were there as well, but they brought all the prop, everything. They ran it for us, gave us traction as we were beginning to launch. Their youth team came out. We had, we had donations of, of money and gear and support. We had a leadership team from the, from the churches that was so helpful for me to have a stability of leadership me doing something I've never done before, being able to ask people who've done it before, help me make, not make bad decisions, make good decisions. All, all of that is how churches should operate together. Uh, there's a new initiative that's uh, sort of been put on the table by Northview called Churches Together. And basically, it's a group of churches like-minded theologically uh, in this area and across Canada. And uh, the idea is basically we're going to help each other to plant churches in varying levels of um, commitment. So for example... Uh, sometimes, if it's a church that's farther away, it might just be financial support. And we've already done that a few times. Uh, Port City Church in Halifax, if you remember, we raised money for that last Christmas, and I think they're starting uh, this fall. Uh, Dawson Creek, there's a church there, MB Church Creekside, we raised money for them. Midtown Church, a church in Vancouver that started. We, we raised money, and also, uh, just so you know, in our budget, we've set aside 2.5% uh, of our overall budget every year is there for church planting. And so we're going to just commit ourselves to being a part of that every year. But we hope that there'll be other church plants that are closer to home that we will actually be a part of, that we will be doing the sending or maybe taking the lead in. That's, that's I think, what it means to really embrace this vision is to, to be partnering at all different ways, different levels, and to actually have some skin in the game. So, so how do we do that? How do we get from a church like us to a church that plants churches? Uh, well, I'd like to focus on four things just today that we could do to start cultivating kind of the heart and the mind towards this. And so uh, here they are. Uh, first thing is this, I think. I think for us to, to get to this mindset of church planting, we need to stop holding on to what we've got. See, if we start looking inward as a church, like if we just are very focused on the, maybe the joy, it's a good thing of us being able to come together, to worship together, the same thing is going to happen to us that happens uh, to individual people. If we just focus on ourselves, we get selfish, we get uh, very comfortable, we get fearful of change. 
right? Because it's good. We don't, we don't want things to change. But we need to remember the words of Jesus. Remember last week in Luke 17? He said, whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life will keep it. He's articulating the nature of faith, where you let go of something lesser, like your life on this earth, your physical life, to grab hold of something greater, spiritual life in Christ. And the same is true for churches. We need to be willing to let go of the good things we have to gain the greater thing, the greater joy of of seeing other people come to faith, other churches planted, the, the kingdom growing exponentially. So I don't know if we're holding on, but I'm just saying let's not do that. Let's have an open hand with everything that God has given us and look for ways to to maximize it for the kingdom. In fact, this is the second thing. What are we going to do? Not hold on. But number two, we want to maximize what we've been given. Uh, So the parable of the talents in Matthew 25 is probably the best uh, just sort of snapshot of what God intends for us to do with what we've been given, everything. So it's it's a parable about a wealthy landowner, and he goes away, but before he goes, he says to his servants, I'm going to give you some of my wealth. They call it talents. Picture like a little bag of money. And so to one servant, he gives one talent, to another two, to another five. And he says, when I come back, I want, I want to see what you've done with it. I'm expecting a return on the resources I've given you. So for the one he gives two talents, two and five, when he comes back, they've doubled it. So he's got four and ten, and his response is, well done. Well done. They did, you know, business ventures some way. They've multiplied it. He said, yes, ex- that's exactly what I was hoping you would do. But to the servant, he gave one talent. That servant was scared was scared that he would lose it, so he just took it and literally buried it in the ground. And then when the master came back, he said, look, I I didn't lose it. I was worried I would lose it. And the master says, you wicked servant. That's that's not what I intended at all. I didn't want you just to bury it. You should at least have gone to the bank, invested, and got some return. And what's very clear, what Jesus is saying is, look, we as followers of Christ, people of God, we should be intentional about identifying the gifts and resources that God has given us and seek to invest them so that we would multiply the kingdom, multiply the impact of the gospel in as much as we can. So that means that we look at the things we've been given. Some of us have been given the ability to make money. Praise God, that's great. We need money to plant churches. That's fantastic. Some of us have been given skills and abilities that would benefit the church, that would be good for for church planting, starting something new. One of the key bottlenecks always for church planting is leadership, to to have qualified mature, able leadership to be able to go out and and begin something new, teaching, preaching, but also administratively, all all those things. We need those. In fact, you can see evidence of of that working well, I think, in Tri-City Church. Uh, There are people in the church leading because they're a part of the church and needs came up. We said at the very beginning, look, we need people to run the different teams. Our ministry team leaders are those who said, yeah, I think I can turn on a coffee maker. I can lead that team. I think parking, uh, welcome. We had others, our staff team. Half of our staff team is made up of people who just put their hand up and said, yeah, I I could do that. Courtney, Sarah, uh, David, Lynette. I remember at the beginning sending an email out. We need someone to help with administration and kids. And Sarah and Courtney said, I I think I could do that. And what a blessing. We need more of that in all areas of ministry, not just at a staff level, but just in every level, so that when opportunities come up to plant, we just have people in the hopper. We have teachers, we have leaders, and we can say, yeah, we're, we're ready to put a team together and let's, and let's do that. So with that mindset, all of us should be thinking to ourselves right now, look, am I, am I cultivating my gifts? One of the reasons we're doing, uh, you may have noticed last week, we talked about doing classes on Sunday mornings. And we're going to start with the foundations class. We'd like to do other ones. is because we think it's important, right, to teach on different areas, um, to benefit people who grow in their faith, but also because we want to have another forum for people within the church to uh, grow their teaching gifts so that we can help identify those who can teach and lead, say, why don't you try this and, and help to grow them so that we're ready. You, you can't just plant a church when we, we don't have leaders growing up within our church. So if that's you, if you're wondering, I wonder if I have a teaching gift. I wonder if I have a leading gift. Talk to David. That's, he's overseeing that area. And that's really our goal. We have it happening really well with the women and the women's ministry. Lynette's got table leaders and teachers uh, growing. We want more of that uh, across the church in all areas of ministry. So maximizing what we've been given. The third thing that we need to be ready for is uh, we need to be ready for loss. Uh, I remember when we were just about to plant Tri-City, 
Uh, I was talking with Lee Francois, who's the lead pastor at Crossridge, one of our sending churches, and I was, I was very excited. I said, Lee, it was like August. It's finally here. We're going to plant. I'm so excited. Aren't you excited? You're going to be planting a church? And I remember Lee's response. He said, he said, I am. I'm very excited. I'm very happy for you to be going. He said, but I'm also a bit heartbroken. He said, because, you know, for us, we're, we're going to be losing a lot of people that, that we love, that we've gotten to know. There's going to be, you know, holes in our areas of ministry, and it's just hard to see, you know, people go that we've gotten close to. And I was like, Lee, you're just raining on my parade. I mean, I was really excited about this. But I understood what he was saying, and I hadn't thought of it from that point of view. And of course it's true. Of course, if we're actually going to be serious about planting churches, then it will mean saying goodbye to people, people that we've become close to. It will mean more work for those who are left behind. It'll be painful on lots of levels. But here again, Jesus is our example and our inspiration. Hebrews 12, 2 says, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus was very comfortable in heaven, perfect communion with the Father, with the Spirit, perfect joy, yet he left there out of love for us. He endured the cross. Why? Because there's a joy after that loss. That There's a joy of accomplishing the plan of the Father, of seeing people come to faith and being able to glorify God, that's the same joy that we need to have in our minds. Being prepared for loss, it's going to be difficult, it's going to, it's going to be painful, but there will be greater joy on the other side. Uh, that pastor I mentioned, J.D. Greer, he's got a book about church planting, and it's just called Gaining by Losing is the title of the book. And that's basically the whole point, that you as a church, you as an individual Christian, will gain even as you lose because you're growing the kingdom. In, in other areas, even if you yourself are experiencing some loss. So we just need to be prepared for that as a church so that when there's opportunities that come up, we, we aren't reluctant to take steps of faith and obedience. Last thing, fourth thing, we need to follow the Holy Spirit. Uh, church planting goes much better if we are doing it according to God's timing and his plan. I've mentioned this before, but if, if it was up to me, we would have planted this church two years earlier. I was, I was ready. I was chomping at the bit. I was, felt called, uh, but the doors weren't opening. The leadership involved weren't uh, letting me do it. They were saying no, and I was very tempted to say, I've got to go do this thing. I've got to go get this started. God's, God's calling. We've got to answer the, the call, but it, it would have been horrible, frankly. We would have been with a team of half as many people, not in this location, not with the support, I'm not, I'm not sure it ever would have even happened. See, God's timing and God's plan is always better, and it's part of the Spirit's role to guide us according to the plan of God. And so this should inform how we pray as a church, that we as individuals should be recognizing, uh, look, I am sent as an individual Christian. Uh, we should be in prayer each morning even. The Holy Spirit, just help me this day to recognize that you've sent me to, to where I work, to where I go to school, where I live, the people around me, that that's, that's part of just the call on my life. Would you help me to look for those opportunities where I can, I can love someone well, I can connect with them well, I can look for an opportunity to share the message that I have. I, I am sent as an individual, but for the church, we also need to be in prayer. Lord, would you make clear to us what you're calling us to as a church? In fact, that's what this Wednesday is all about, is this day of fasting and worship and prayer. We do this every year, but in particular, this, this year, what I'm, what I'm hoping that we will do, especially, again, for the members of the church, is that you will set aside some time, some extra time, getting up earlier, whatever it would be, to pray and be in prayer. Holy Spirit, would you lead us as a church? Would you? This is on our hearts. We see this biblically. We want to be a church that multiplies that does whatever we can with the resources you've given us, but, but what is the right direction? What is the right timing? Pray for the leadership, for us as elders, that we would have a sense of, of what's right. Pray for those within the church that might have those teaching or preaching gifts, that, that they would grow in that, and we'd come to a place where all the pieces on the board are there, and we can, we can make a move. But we need, we need a unity around this. We need a willingness to step out in faith, and so we need to pray for this. So I, please, this, this Wednesday fast in some way, just a way to draw near to the Lord and then come together in the evening to worship and pray. This, let me just say this, this isn't going to happen unless our hearts are in it. And so if our hearts aren't, aren't in it, then, I mean, it's going to be eventually dry here. 
What we want is a vibrant ministry where God continues to send and we continue to send out. And we, we are continually pushing and taking steps of faith, putting ourselves in positions where we have to trust God. And it begins with a heart that, that says, yes, Lord, we want to submit ourselves to that. So let us not be impatient, but let us be ready. And let us on this day celebrate all that God has done in the past because that gives us confidence for what will come in the future. We will have the joy of seeing more people come to faith and, and we ourselves will grow as we take those steps of faith. So let's pray and then we'll worship together to close our time. Lord Jesus, again, we are thankful. Thankful that you did not stay at a distance even though we had our backs turned to you, even though we had clearly made a choice to go our own way in our sin. You loved us. You, you, along with the Father, had a plan to save us. You came to us and you lived the life we could never live and then died the death we deserved on our behalf. And so, Lord Jesus, we just praise you for that. Our heart, Lord Jesus, is to see more of that and so I pray for us as a church. I pray that we would not be satisfied just with a full room or, or a few gatherings full. I pray, Lord Jesus, we would see that the best thing is for there to be exponential growth, that we would plant churches and send people out, missionaries, wherever it may be, and that they would spread the gospel and that by your spirit and his power, Lord, we would have the joy of seeing the kingdom grow. So I pray, Lord Jesus, that there would be a, a joy and a thankfulness of what you've done, but in a sense that we would not be satisfied that we will want more of this and more, and more people to experience this. So please, Lord Jesus, would you grow in us a heart that is rooted in you so that we'd be open-handed with everything you've given us and that we would be faithful in the years to come and that 30, 40 years from now, we'd be able to look back and just rejoice again in all that you've done. And so we thank you for your power at work in our lives and in our church, and we pray for that same power to move out into our community. For your glory, we pray these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're going to worship.